The Priest's Pavan by A. Murray Gilchrist Read by Connor Kay Yesternight I took my viol and made my way over the limestone cliffs to the concave where stand the ruins of Woodsets, the house Vignola, he who designed St. Angelo's castle in Rome, had built beside the fallen abbey for his boon fellow, Bateman de Caus. And as I sat, drawing the strings together, nigh the pedestal of the goddess of plenty in the white summer house, behold, the overgrown yew and privet bushes that had once been clipped in forms of dragon and hippogriff, shrank again to their old preciseness, and the terminal statues rose from the grass, and the wreathed columns bore again their garment of midsummer roses. I played the priest's pavan that I had learned from the Book of Airs, and at the first note the fire stains on the frontispiece vanished, and one by one the gaping windows donned their lattices, and the leaden roof shone above the parapet, and the light of a thousand sconces fell about me in broken relics of gold. It was no longer the burr of my viol that rang in my ears, but the chirping of a virginals in music that was conceived by a divinity. One noontide, more than ten years ago, my lord came to the town and found me by the table in my chamber, copying in fair hand the suite of dances that I had made for Daphne's wedding. His tumid red face shone unctuously, his attire was disordered with the heat. He flung a parchment book upon the table and laughed as he ever laughed, like one drunk with wine. To other morning, when they took up a stone that had cracked in the monk's chapel, said he, my steward found this in a brazen casket, a set of dances such as are not used nowadays, of music far superior to aught such crickets as you create. I could not demure, for my lord was a cognoscento, and although he oft times affected liking for my work and professed to find genius therein, I knew that twas but humble in his regard. His life had been spent in the great world. Players and singers had been damned by his frown. So I took up the book, and opening its pages, saw quaintly shapen notes ranging up and down like little coffins draped in scarlet and black. Tis in looped tabulation, I said, a book of the airs ecclesiastics loved ere the Reformation brought them low. I, commented my lord, mayhap the work of the white monk who haunts the precincts o' nights, him the humble folk call Ambrose. The very sight of that page evokes pictures of woodmen's wives, oddly gowned, hey tricks come go tricksing in the cloisters. But farewell to this light talk. Madam, when I put it in her hand, she hath a rage for antiquities, sat her down to the harpsichord, and played things that drove away the scene before our eyes, and set us a-wandering in strange places. She fell a-longing, and by her whim all the plans for music at our little mistress's nuptials are changed. That which you have done shall be brought to light when the lass gives her master a fine boy. Her mother has sworn to revive all the dances. See here, at the end is the description. And our guests are being taught, galliards, lavolters, pavans. What I have come to tell is that naught will content her save that the musicians, receiving their due pay, be disbanded, and that you alone will sit in the gallery and tinkle an ancient virginals from sunset to midnight, whilst we, poor fools, hop and scurry like grigs. My heart was burdened with disappointment, but I held my peace. Daphne had been my pupil. I had taught her rosy fingers to dash like fire drakes over the keys to draw softer notes than the wood doves. I had not seen the bridegroom, the match was made at court, or perchance the excellence of my music might have been marred. As it was, 
I had thrown into each chord a speech of my devotion to the maid. She had ever known that I regarded her with great tenderness, and being endowed, despite her green youth, with a keener insight than her fellows, had twined wreaths of laurel for my grey head, and made my chamber ever bright with flowers. The knowledge that he, whom her parents had chosen, was a man of advanced years and more than evil fame, had distressed me for a while. But the child, from her very innocence, had hitherto displayed no distaste when she spoke of the future. My lord gave me a folded paper. Madam hath writ here the order of the dances, he said. There is but short time for you to study, since, the wedding day being Thursday, the book must be returned to her on the morrow. The priest's pavan is the last, tis the wildest thing in the world, all strutting and curtsying and twisting the arms and pointing downwards with the thumbs. Anan, Master Fiddler, I must leave you, for my son-in-law waits below, too gouty to climb your stairs. Be sure no harm comes to the book, for, if I may believe, madame, it has worth above rubies. He descended, panting to his chariot. Peering from my casement, I saw beside the open panel the face of the bridegroom, wrinkled, yellow, and unholy, with the dull eyes that only sparkle at the sight of the table or of a woman's loveliness. His lace cravat hung beneath his chin like the beard of an African ape. He poked his fingers betwixt my lord's ribs and cackled foolishly. "'Tis a wench you keep there,' he cried. "'To the deuce with your talk of music men, a sweet morsel, red and creamy as temple's nectarines, and with hair soft and light as tow. Send for her down, so that I may look on your choice. A minx, I vow, madam shall know. I heard no more, for the stone horses leapt forward, and the chariot lurched away towards the marketplace, where the fresh huckster wenches from the uplands stood beside their stores. When the by-street was quiet again, I passed to my harpsichord, and played the music of The Book of Airs from end to end, finding at the very first that a masterpiece of either good or evil genius lay before me on the stand. Never before had I dreamed of melody so exquisitely pleasurable, so bitterly painful. In each were two things, the flitting of white angels over the lawns of heaven and the dancing of fiends around the tormenting fires of hell. The fragrance of ever-blooming flowers and the stench of brimstone hovered about in ghostly clouds. I heard the laughter of pure children and the cachinations of imps. Ere long half my chamber was filled with a radiance infinitely brighter than the dying sun's. The other half was lost in impenetrable blackness. My body was sick and trembling, but my spirit was full of eager delight. At the priest's pavan, I was overcome with frenzy and with ecstasy. This told of the war between heaven and hell, of the clashing of archangels' lances, of devils rushing forward and falling back, of breaches made in golden ramparts, of Apollon leading his myrmidons almost to the battlements, but the voice of God was lifted in thunder, and hell with its warriors sank seething together through chaos. My fingers curled like the talons of a bird, my head sank till my chin lay upon my breast. This was no budget of dancers, no toy to please madam, the countess withal, but an epic of divinity. Perchance it had passed from generation to generation of churchmen, as our Bible in later years hath passed to us. Twas music such as is heard at the triumphal feasts of cherubim. I will not play it, I said, although I lose my Lord's favour, I'll be no party to profanity. Tis not meet that such as group about the court should caper to its passion. In the night time, as I lay sleepless, 
the parchment shone like touchwood. I rose, hid it in a coffer, yet still I knew of its glittering, and the obsession remained. At dawn I enclosed it in my leathern wallet and prepared to start for woodsets, but on the threshold I was met by Daphne, hooded, so that until she had unknotted the throat strings, none might have known her for the bride. The women rose betimes, to gather midsummer dew, she said, and I stole apart and ran, so that I might bid my master farewell, and tell him how that I shall ever pray for his fame. The maid was pale as death, her eyes were red with restlessness and weeping. I drew her into the chamber, and there, as she had still the ways of a child, she sat upon my knee and passed her fingers through my hair and kissed my forehead. "'Tis a long farewell," she whispered. "'Who knows that I may ever return? I have fear at times that my life must shortly reach its term. I would fain have you think of me sometimes. I am old and withered, Miss Daphne," I made answer, "'and there is no hope of fame for old men, but as long as I have breath, you shall lie in the innermost cabinet." Big tears rolled down her cheeks. Ah, master, she sighed. Tis hard to go away from the folk here to a strange country with one I understand nothing of and to know that he will be with me always. My mother tells me to have no fear for my husband will hold me as the apple of his eye. Alack, to be without young playmates. She dried her face with her kerchief and rose her glance fell on the book in the wallet. Will you not play to me of that music? She said. Tomorrow night all dance to it. We are being instructed in the oddest steps. I shook my head. Nay, little one, you must never hear it. This morning I take it back to your lady mother with word that I cannot follow her behest. Daphne sank to her knees and clasped my neck. Then play it to me, but once, she pleaded. I was ever an apt learner, and it may be that I shall understand. When I heard before, out of the harshness came a curious joy. But you will turn each note into a strung jewel. I gave her no naysay, but moved to the harpsichord and played. And behind me, at first, I heard a sound of moaning then of breath leaping after breath. But when I came to the priest's pavan, Daphne was silent as the grave. I turned to find her standing erect with rapt countenance, her hands clasped over burgeoning breasts. A while passed ere she spoke. Her voice came low and trembling. "'Tis my desire, master, that you play thus at my nuptials and she left the chamber with no other word. So it was that on the appointed night I sat alone in the musician's gallery of the ballroom at Woodsets. This place had in long past times been the refectory of the monks, and the master builder, Vignola, had chosen that save for the new floor of oak that swung on iron chains, all should remain unaltered. Behind the tapestries of the goblins, which my lord's father had purchased, still might be found dim wall pictures of Christ at Gethsemane, of the Virgin and of the Apostles. The light of the candles showed the company from the court, all bedizened with trinkets and plumes and brocades, moving to and fro in clusters. Madame came secretly up the narrow staircase and beckoned me into the shadow, not deeming it fit that the wedding guests should see her converse with one so inferior. The lines of her forehead were eloquent of caprice and satisfaction. No chance had I to speak with you before, she said. The whirl of this merry day hath held me every moment. What think you of the bride, almost a woman now? tomorrow on the way to matronhood. Looking down, I saw Daphne quivering affrightedly like a white culver amongst ravens. 
At hand sauntered the groom, simpering, whispering to the menfolk behind screening fingers. I know not what to think, I said. Madame gave no heed. Impatient for the signal of withdrawal, I protest. See how restlessly she stirs. But master, what of the music? What of my plan of giving life again to these ancient dances? Tis vastly taking. Duchess Mary, she who wears the somber gown with the yellow leaves, declares that her recollection tells that not according to the teachers of the book were galliards and levolters danced. They say her age exceeds the century. The beldam dotes, but even if she be right, why, tis a fine thing to dance in styles past human memory. And even if, as she fears, they be enchanted dances, tis so much the better. It may be that ghosts will rise. Whereat she made her mocking curtsy and withdrew. And anon I began the first air, and the floor swayed under mad caprioles. And in the pause I looked downward again, and saw that each face save Daphne's had grown wan and pregnant with unutterable wickedness. But the maid was blushing, as if the breeze of April clipped her cheeks. She had stolen apart from the rest, and, bride though she was, all was so intent upon their performance that she passed unobserved. Methought, as dance followed dance, a thin, sulfury vapour rose and wrapped about these revellers, so that their bodies grew vague, and little was to be seen but their lustful, blinking eyes. Still, Daphne stood alone and neglected, toying with the rose at her girdle. The voice of the virginals swelled so that all other sound was hidden. The mist grew ever thicker and thicker, ere the playing of the priest Pavan, it seemed as if horny wings had risen from the shoulders of each dancer, and the skin of each had swarthened under the powder. Then, to the first notes were made the magic twists and downturning of the thumbs, and of a sudden, with one accord, the dancers ceased all movement, and my hands fell numbed, for the tapestry of the eastern wall was drawn aside, and one clothed as a priest in shining vestments entered through an arched doorway and moved to the place where Daphne waited. A hallowed light emanated from his face and hands so that none might see. As he approached the maid, this radiance wound about her in tender embrace. She showed no signs of blenching, but sank before him as the Magdalene sank before Christ. He raised her with infinite gentleness and put his arm about her waist and led her to the place whence he had come. There followed no murmur of anger or surprise, but, as I gazed, smoke and tongues of fire leapt from every crevice of the floor, and in a minute there came the noise of iron chains snapping. Then, as flames leapt to lick the roof, one hoarse wail of agony.